I've had my fair share of weird and creepy encounters in my life, but this experience has truly left me frightened, and it still creeps me out when I say his name. John. For context, I'm a 20-year-old female, but this story takes place during my childhood. When I was just a kid, my mom and stepfather owned a maintenance company, and we lived in the middle of nowhere in the south. It was a very small town where everyone knew each other. Because of this, there was always a communal trust among the town folk. Every so often, my parents would get a job that was just too big for them to complete on their own. When that happened, they would hire local boys, usually from the high school or community college. Again, it was a very small town that still believed in southern hospitality, so it wasn't unusual for these boys to be invited over for dinner. John was in his mid-twenties and had only recently moved to our town from New York. He was a bit awkward, but he was a very hard worker, and at first, he came across as a very kind-hearted person. I was 11 when John started working for my family. He would come join us for meals after his shifts. My big sister, who was just a few years younger than John, had recently moved out west, and I missed her a lot. So when John began talking to me, I was very excited. It was not in a romantic way. At first... I viewed it as now having a big brother type figure who thought that my middle school drama was interesting to listen to over dinner. My family liked John and hired him for the next few jobs they got. John continued to be very friendly towards me, but all of us just thought he was being nice to me, and there was nothing more to it than that. September rolls around. John had been working for my family for a couple of months at this point. My birthday was coming up, and my family promised to take me bowling. It was an hour's drive away, so this was a big deal for me. Somehow, John ends up inviting himself. I remember thinking it was weird, but John had always been so nice, and I didn't want to be rude and say that I didn't want him there. In addition to their maintenance company, my parents were also heavily involved in the local fire department. Every year, we would volunteer to do this haunted hayride event, where actors would dress up like monsters, go out into the woods, and scare the guests that came through, with all the revenue going to the fire department. The event was scheduled to start two weeks after my birthday. My mother mentioned it to John, and he says that he was very interested in helping out. My mom, bless her heart, is the sweetest southern lady you have ever seen and says, of course. She put him in contact with the man who runs it. Well, John was hired, and ended up being put in the same area as my family, because he apparently didn't want to work with strangers. Being a tight-knit community, none of us were concerned that a grown man was going out of his way to be around me all the time. Things were starting to get weird. Mind you, this event required us to work long, late nights. At the beginning of the season, there would sometimes be long gaps between groups. The first weekend, we had a gap like that. A boy that I was friends with was working in the next station over, and I told my mom that I was going to say hello to him real quick. I took the path through the woods, so that I wouldn't be seen in case another group came through. As I'm walking, I hear footsteps behind me. I turn around, and there's John. Hey John, what are you doing out here? I saw you leaving. I just wanted to make sure you didn't get hurt out here. Oh, I'm fine. My mom knows where I am. The most dangerous thing in these woods are deer. I still don't feel comfortable with you walking around here alone. Come on. John grabbed my arm, and this freaks me out, and I quickly pulled away. Um, I'm just gonna go back to my station. For the rest of that night, 
John always managed to show up whenever I was alone to talk to me. I never mentioned this to my mom because I still felt that my discomfort toward him was rude. My family liked him, so surely I should too? Fast forward to February. John hasn't been around much because most of the jobs coming in didn't require him. On Valentine's Day, I got home and I see a vase of red roses in the kitchen. I asked my mom if my stepdad had given them to her. She says no and handed me a card. It said something like, You're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. My mom asked me if any boys at school would send me something like that. I tell her no. At that time, there was no boy in school who was interested in me in that way. The next week, John stops by my house. While he was there, he asked me, So, did you like the flowers? I play dumb. Uh, what flowers? He seemed upset at my answer. Later on, I tell my mom, and she immediately calls him up. John, what the fuck were you thinking sending my daughter those flowers? It was just a friendly gesture. I just thought a pretty girl deserved to have roses on Valentine's Day. Don't ever pull some shit like that again, John. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Come April, mysterious bouquets of flowers started getting delivered weekly, almost daily. My mom must have known it was John. She calls him again and tells him to cut it out and that he's no longer welcomed at our house. Not long after that, I was downstairs messing around on the family computer in the living room when I heard a tap on the window beside me. I looked out and there was John, standing on our porch, a creepy smile plastered on his face. I admit I wasn't as alarmed as I should have been. I guess I was still too young to understand the horrifying implications of John's behavior. I got up, poked my head out the door, and told him, Hey, my mom doesn't want you coming around here anymore. I just want to talk. Being a dumb 12-year-old, I joined him on the porch. You are the most beautiful woman in the world, and I love you. I know you're still young right now, so I'll wait for a few years. I immediately got up and went back inside and quickly got the attention of my mom. I was so upset that I was crying and shaking. My parents went downstairs to confront him. John! Get the fuck off our property now, or we'll shoot your ass. You're just trying to deny us our love. What the fuck? John eventually leaves, but before he did, he gave a few parting words. You can't keep her away from me forever. We will be together, one way or another. We called the cops right away and got a restraining order. Remember that whole small town part I mentioned earlier? Well, it turns out, small towns don't take kindly to grown-ass men who harass underage girls. John essentially got driven out and went back to New York City. I think that's finally the end of it. But then, that's when the phone call started. He would call me from burner phones, so the numbers were never the same. My mom forbade me from answering the phone unless I knew who it was. Before all this, I always answered unknown numbers, since her house phone was also the company number, and it might have been clients calling. My mom didn't tell me until much later that the calls got continuously more violent and sexual in nature. They would always contact the police, but very little was ever done. Then, things suddenly stopped, and it seemed like it was finally over. When I started high school, I soon forgot about John. Boys my own age began to like me, and everything seemed to be normal until the end of my senior year. A letter came in addressed to me. You're old enough now. I've been waiting just like I said I would. Soon, I'll be back, and we can be together. 
just like we planned. The cops were called again, and my school was informed. I only had a month left until graduation, and my teachers watched me like hawks. My mom insisted on coming to pick me up every day. I wasn't allowed to leave with anyone else. I felt alone and disconnected from my friends, and the fear I experienced four years prior had returned in full force. We were contacted by the police a few weeks later, and they told us that the NYPD had arrested John on unrelated charges, but that they couldn't disclose much more than that. I foolishly thought that would be the end of it. After graduation, I moved a few hours away and landed a pretty sweet acting job. That October, two things happened in one week. Another letter arrived at my mom's house. It was just as frightening and threatening as the first. I'm not even going to repeat what it said, but it was very graphic. I also received a note in my dressing room, at my job. Confused, I opened it up. It was an invitation to meet up with an old friend. I have no clue if this was related to John, but something tells me that this is too strange just to be a coincidence. I haven't heard from John since, and I've moved again since that last letter. I don't know if he's still in jail. Hopefully he is. As traumatic as all of this was for me, I sincerely hope he has never put any other young girls through this. When I was in high school, I lived in a very small town in Texas. It was the kind of place where everyone was either related to each other or hated each other. I had no family there, so... Yeah. I did have a pretty blonde girlfriend and was pretty hated for that too. Nothing major, just some petty harassment and occasional fighting. But at the time, things had been escalating. So that's why on Valentine's Day, my girlfriend and I decided to skip the school dance and just stay in and watch a movie at her house while her parents went out. It was just better to avoid any kind of trouble. We borrowed her dad's car, a little Honda hatchback, and went into town. We stopped at the video store, and afterwards we went to Dairy Queen and headed back to her house. Now, she lived in the boonies. It was out in the middle of the forest, along a lonely road, with no streetlights. We were chatting and eating our blizzards, when all of a sudden a car comes up behind us. No big deal. It became a big deal when the headlights flooded the interior of our car, and I saw a pair of hands on the back seat, and the top of someone's head peering up from the hatchback. The lights had illuminated somebody hiding in the back of our car. As soon as the lights hit, the head and hands retreated back down. A solid chill ran through the entire length of my body. I slowly reached down and pulled out my pocket knife. It was the only thing I had. My girlfriend saw me and asked what was wrong. I then responded, Nothing. I just had to stop at my friend's house real quick. She knew that was bullshit. I didn't have any friends. I pulled over at the next house that came up and jumped out of the car, yelling at her to do the same. She jumped out in total confusion. I flipped the driver's seat forward and lunged into the back seat in full maniac mode. The intruder popped up like a jack-in-a-box with empty hands waving. Hey, hey, relax. What are y'all up to tonight? It was some weird kid from our high school who we had never spoken to before, ever. What in the holy fuck are you doing in our car? I thought you guys were going to the dance. I was just hitching a ride. We sat there staring at him with our mouths open, wondering what to do. He tried to act real cool, and obviously we were in the middle of nowhere in some random person's driveway. We ended up driving him to the dance and dropping him off. 
The whole time he was telling us to come inside with him. Yeah, not happening. We dropped his ass off and sped out of there as fast as we could. When we got back to my girlfriend's house, she began crying and was shaking. She was completely freaked out. I still have no idea what he was planning on doing when the lights caught him crawling out of the hatchback. Yeah, I fucking hated high school. I live in a small town in the Midwest. It's relatively safe. The crime rate is pretty low, mostly consisting of domestic disputes and traffic violations. There is only about 20,000 people in the town, and it seems like I see someone I know or at least recognize out in public every single day. Back in 2008, I was about to turn 19, and I wanted to have a real party for my birthday. I graduated from a private Christian high school and I had never partied before, even during my first year at a state university. I just wasn't ever interested because my friends weren't either. I was just a small town girl at a big university who didn't really get noticed, other than the guys that shared my boyfriend's dorm floor, asking me what I was doing with him. They were hitting on me, but at the time I was in love with my boyfriend. That year, I decided it was going to be different. I had dropped out of college and had broken up with my boyfriend. I had a few new friends who were the party type and they seemed to always be talking about how much fun it was to go to the house parties. I wanted my 19th birthday to be the first time I ever got drunk, so my older friends helped me buy alcohol and invited all of our close friends over to my house. The night came and went. Fun was had, and my friends commented on how great my house was for parties. I lived alone in a three-bedroom house with an attached garage, so people who wanted to stay over could stay in one of the bedrooms, and the people who wanted to smoke had easy access to the garage. We sometimes moved my car out of the garage and into the driveway to play some beer pong. My friends really pushed the idea of me having more parties. I loved meeting new people, so we started partying at my house every weekend. It wasn't difficult to get people to come to our parties. It was August, and there were three colleges around our town. More than once, my house would be full of people I didn't know. I woke up a lot to find random strangers in my house, but one of my friends always took responsibility for inviting each stranger over. It wasn't a big deal to me at the time. I would just clean up the house, go to work during the week, and have another party on the weekend. These parties weren't crazy or anything. There weren't any drugs involved, just alcohol, which I thought was totally safe. One day in September, when I was leaving for work, I went to shut the garage door, when I noticed that my door remote wasn't on the car's sun visor where I usually kept it. I thought maybe it had fallen off so I got out and searched under the seats. I was more annoyed than scared, because I thought I had maybe taken it out while I was drunk or something. I shut the garage by punching in the code on the wall panel, and went through the house to get back to my car, and headed for work. That night at work, I clocked out for lunch, and as soon as I entered the parking lot, my phone rang. The caller ID displayed, unknown number. I thought it was one of my friends calling me as a prank, because that's something that we did a lot. I answered, expecting somebody to ask me something stupid in a weird accent. But there was nothing. Complete silence. I thought it was weird, so I just hung up, and I didn't want to waste my break dealing with stupid prank phone calls. Everything continued on as normal. We closed the store, and I was walking back to my car when I got another call. It was from an unknown number again. There was that same silence when I answered. I really thought it was one of my friends because I hadn't had any missed calls. 
And how could this person be calling me as soon as I clocked out and knew that I had my phone on me? My friends were all familiar with my schedule, so this had to be the only explanation. I called my friend Lacey, and she said that she had no idea what I was talking about. I didn't believe her at first, but then her boyfriend verified that she had been with him, and they certainly did not call me. I wasn't sure what to think. I brushed it off and forgot about it as soon as I got home. I had the next couple of days off, and usually on my days off I slept in pretty late. I woke up around 11 the next day and got out of bed. I grabbed my phone and went into the living room when it began ringing. You guessed it. It was from an unknown number. There was nothing but silence when I answered. This happened a couple of times throughout the day, and I was getting pretty annoyed by then. I was also annoyed that I still couldn't find my garage door remote. I looked everywhere that day, eventually just giving up. I thought maybe it had fallen out of my car while I was out. Fast forward about three weeks. The calls started happening every single day. The most unsettling part of all of this... They would happen only when I was available to answer my phone. I never had any missed calls during work or when I was asleep. As soon as I would step out of my workplace, the unknown number would call me again. I really thought somebody was going to some great lengths to play a prank on me. But even stranger things began happening. I stopped parking in the garage because it was so annoying to go through the house to open or close the garage door. One day, when I left for work, I backed up and heard a loud scraping noise beneath my car. I got out, and there were these huge tree branches underneath my car. I had no idea how they got there, but it was annoying to get them out from under my vehicle. About a week later, I heard a loud bang at my front door. When I went to go check, there was a tree branch sitting on my porch, right outside my front door. This was when I called Lacey, and basically told her that I had to stay at her house for a couple of nights. I was terrified. I went to Lacey's and sure enough, the unknown number called. I didn't answer that call. Five seconds later, Lacey's phone rang. It was from unknown number. We were super freaked out. I told her not to answer it. At this point, I knew it was either a mutual friend playing this crazy, drawn-out prank on us, or we had a real stalker on our hands. I decided to tell one of my managers at work what had been happening. He immediately told me to call the police the next time I received a call. Like clockwork, my phone rang as I walked to my car during lunch break. I called the police after listening to silence for a full minute. The police basically told me that they couldn't trace the call. But they did say that they would send a police officer to watch my house for a couple of days to see if they noticed anything. Nothing but phone calls happened over the next week. I wasn't too scared anymore. I actually started to become pretty mean to the unknown caller, saying that they were a coward and asking why they were doing this. After following up with the police, they apologized that this was happening, but said that there wasn't really much that they could do. Tree branches began showing up in the middle of my front yard, and I would hear banging noises on my front windows at night. For some reason, I didn't feel safe in my room anymore, and I started sleeping on the couch. One night, I went to the kitchen to grab a glass of water when the unknown number called me again. I became so frightened that I called up Lacey, and she came over to stay with me. I didn't understand how this was happening, because I never saw anyone watching me or anything and I never noticed anyone following me or watching me from a distance whenever I was out. Sometimes there would be napkins inside my screen door, 
or stacks of blank paper in my grass. I got markers in my mailbox. There would be candy wrappers on top of my car. Whoever was doing this was very strange. This continued until winter break. On Christmas Eve, I was driving out to my grandfather's farm to celebrate with my family. I received a call. I was so frustrated by now, I picked up the phone and started screaming at the person on the other end, saying that it was Christmas and they should just let me celebrate with my family in peace. I called them a freak and asked them what they wanted. Tears began rolling down my face. Things devolved to the point where I just started begging them to leave me alone. But as always, there was nothing but silence on the other end. After the celebration, I drove back to my house. That night, I was sleeping on my couch when I woke up to a light in my face. Somebody was outside, shining a flashlight through my windows. I wasn't sure what to do, so I ran and locked myself in the bathroom and called Lacey. She immediately came over. We looked around and found no one. I was so scared, but she stayed over, and that made me feel a lot safer. The calls kept coming, and the police still did nothing. Nothing happened outside of my house. There were no more branches, or weird things turning up on my porch. I began sleeping in my room again, because I thought maybe they had backed off. One morning I woke up, when I noticed through the kitchen door window that my garage was open. I thought maybe it had gotten stuck on something, and I just hadn't noticed. I went over to the wall panel and punched in the code, and watched it close. I tried to put it out of my mind, and grabbed a glass of milk, and went to go sit at the dining room table. And that's when I saw it. My missing garage door remote was sitting on my dining room table. Of course, I freaked out. I was still in my pajamas, but I ran to my car and drove. I didn't even know where I was going. I just called my best friend Lacey and told her it was time to move. We had been talking about moving to a different city for a while, and I told her now was the time. Lacey and her boyfriend came over to my house with me to help me check things out, but of course, no one was there. We soon got an apartment in a different city, and the phone call stopped as soon as we moved. I remember it was Valentine's Day. We were having a girl's day out, so we went out and enjoyed a movie. I told her that I was going to leave my phone in the apartment. I remember plugging it in the charger in the kitchen before we left. On our way back to the car, Lacey and I were chatting about the film, and I saw something sitting beside the car on the ground. It was my phone. We both died a little inside, and ended up staying at her boyfriend's house that night. There was no sign of anyone being in our apartment the next day when we got there. Unfortunately, I never found out who was behind this. No one has fessed up. I know that none of my friends would have let me live in a constant state of fear for nearly five months. I even asked a few random people who were at my house parties that I didn't know that well, but no one had any idea what I was talking about. It was March 12th, 2019. I was home alone that night. My parents were on vacation and my sister was spending the night with her girlfriend. Nothing unusual. I was lying in bed, scrolling through my phone, when I received a text from my boyfriend. We'll call him Mike. Hey, what are you doing? I texted him back saying, I'm just chilling, nothing special. We chatted for a while, and we decided that he would come over to my house since everybody was gone. I sprang up from my bed and got myself ready. Some time passed before I heard a knock at my front door. That wasn't normal for him. He was one of those cliche boyfriends who would usually climb through my bedroom window. 
but since I was alone that night, I figured he didn't want to risk busting his ass. I went downstairs and looked through the peephole. No one was there. I then texted my boyfriend. Hey, where do you go? He opened the text and read it, but did not respond. I thought that was strange. My thoughts were immediately interrupted as I heard another loud set of knocks, this time at the back door. Now, I was becoming nervous, and a feeling of dread began to set in. I received another text, not from my boyfriend this time, but from his brother. I almost dropped the phone when I read what was on the screen. Mike lost his phone earlier today. He wanted me to tell you that he's going to be busy tonight studying for his exams. My heart practically skipped a beat when I received another text from Mike's number. You look so adorable in your pajamas. Now I knew that somebody I didn't know was outside, watching me. Thinking quickly, I called my boyfriend's number. I heard a ringtone from upstairs, in my bedroom. I ran down the hall to my parents' room. My dad always kept a gun in his closet. After locking the door, I pulled it out, asking myself if I could go through with actually shooting someone. I heard footsteps above me. They soon slowly made their way down the stairs. I called at 911 and reported the break-in, whispering into the phone. The dispatch told me the cops would be on their way. My stomach dropped when another call came in. The intruder had dialed my number. In all the panic, I forgot to put my phone on silent. I then heard laughter coming from down the hall. <laughs> I cannot explain to you how terrifying it is to hear someone laughing in that situation. I was now scared for my life. I then heard a loud bang on the bedroom door. It soon flew open as the intruder entered the room. I saw the shine of a knife in his hand as he raised it into the air. I staggered back but aimed my father's pistol and pulled the trigger. Mind you, I had never fired a gun before. My dad showed me how to operate it, but hadn't taken me to the range yet. I can't explain how this happened because my eyes were closed. But the shot I fired knocked the knife from the intruder's hand. I then aimed the gun at his head. Don't move, I told him, making my voice sound as aggressive as possible. The guy must have thought I was a sharpshooter and had no idea that I actually got lucky. The police soon arrived and forced their way inside the house. They followed my shouting and made their way to the bedroom, where I still had the intruder at gunpoint. Two officers put the man into cuffs. Once I got a good look at him, I can honestly say that I didn't recognize him from anywhere. Once he was in the back seat of a cruiser, one of the officers sat me down and took my statement. Long story short, my parents ended their vacation early, and my sister came home the next day. We still have no idea how long he had been watching me for, and how he managed to get Mike's phone. We're all glad that I made it out of that situation alive, and that the man is where he belongs, in jail. This story happened to me when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time, and I had three siblings that also lived at home, my brother and two sisters. For context, we lived on five acres in a rural area in Ohio, surrounded on both sides by forest and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m., 
so I had always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house, because he was gone during the times where you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was a weekend, my dad was actually home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs, and coming out of our rooms you could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked over at the clock and saw that it was 2.30 a.m. My brother told me that there were two men at our front door. Now, this really woke me up. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. There was no one there, but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me there were two guys that had been talking to each other and knocking on our door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my gun, quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the front door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs. My brother was right behind me as we headed over to where my parents were. My parents had awoken to the sound of our dog barking and had come down to find these two men loudly knocking at the door. At this point, the men returned and began knocking again. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where the houses are spread out by a hundred yards and still knocking despite a dog barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes, the men walked away and we all shuffled across the kitchen into the family room to peek out the windows into our driveway, which was lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was behind the wheel from what we could see. Immediately the question was, where do these guys go? They weren't in their car, and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately, we found out the answer when the handles on our back doors started rattling. They were now actively trying to force their way inside. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying my dad's name as pure terror overwhelmed her. Then, two things happened. Adrenaline rushed through me as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to use it. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone and called the police and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute, they stopped trying to get inside and disappeared again, only to return to the front door and started knocking again. Several minutes had gone by and we suddenly saw the local police flying up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted, attempting to run the long way around the house. One of them disappeared from our view, while another was intercepted by an officer, yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't cooperate and was immediately tased. Some of the other officers went around the house after the other man, while another came up to talk to my dad. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my little sister's playhouse in the backyard. Both of them were under the influence of drugs. They found cocaine on one of the men. They were both arrested that night, but we never found out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, this whole experience wasn't fun. Growing up in a house in the middle of nowhere seems to generate this kind of story. I think I must have been around nine years old when this happened. My mom was a single mother. Our nearest neighbor was within running distance, but definitely not shouting distance. There was a main road that ran past our house. We would maybe have two to three cars pass by in the evening. People who were heading into town and avoiding the highway. Our nights were almost always very quiet. It was the kind of place where if you heard a knock on the door, your blood ran cold for a couple of seconds. It usually meant that somebody was lost 
or maybe someone had crashed their car on the awkward winding road. Also, for some reason at the time, we didn't have any curtains. We had these huge windows on both sides of our living room. It would always creep me out a bit whenever I was home alone, but my mom never seemed to worry about it. It was a Friday night. We were in the living room watching a movie with our dog. It was pretty much our weekend tradition. It was dark, so it must have been late. That's when we heard a knock on the door. We looked at each other. Both of us were instantly freaked out. But my mother being the adult, calms down and heads to the door, with me following close behind. She unlocks all the locks on the door and opens it up, but there was no one there. She instantly closes the door, and I start silently panicking and looking at my mom for an explanation. She gave some weak excuse about a deer running into the door or something, which I obviously did not believe, but I didn't argue with her. She seemed to convince herself that everything was fine and sends me off to bed. Saturday night comes around. Being a child, I pretty much had forgotten about the night before, and I think my mom convinced herself that it didn't happen. I don't think it will surprise anyone what happened after that. The knock came again. Obviously, I instantly remembered what happened the night before, and a chill runs through my body. I don't know if any of you have ever seen your parents who look genuinely frightened, but when you're a small child, there is nothing more terrifying. We make our way to the front door, and again, no one is there. This time, we're both undeniably freaked out. As I said before, our living room had these big windows on both sides. When the lights were on, we couldn't see anything outside. But obviously, if anyone was outside, they could see us. Our living room was also at the center of our house and had the only phone directly in front of one of these big windows. The thought of walking into that room, knowing that whoever was knocking on the door could see us, was beyond creepy. We sat in the kitchen for a while, trying to figure out what to do next. Eventually, my mom had to do something. She said it was probably some kids playing a prank. Even back then, I knew she was grasping at straws. She carefully heads to the phone in the living room to call the police. It was nerve-wracking, but the police eventually showed up. They do a walkthrough of our property and find nothing. They then tell us to call again if anything happens. Over the next three nights, the same thing happened. The police came every time, but since we were out in the middle of nowhere, I can only assume that whoever was responsible had disappeared by the time they got there. Obviously, my mother was terrified at this point. Living with just her young daughter in the house, I can't imagine how scary this was for her. The police eventually agreed to do a stakeout on our house at night. There was a little path that runs off the main road that led to the front of our house, so that's where they decided to set up, but they made sure that they were out of sight. It was Friday night again, so I was allowed to stay up that night and saw what happened. It was exciting, but also kind of scary. During the stakeout, the police observed someone pulling over on the main road, turning off his lights and engine. He made his way down the side road, which had the perfect view into our living room, where he sat for two hours, watching our house, before sneaking up to the front door. This was the point where the police made their move and arrested him. We had no idea who he was. He lived several towns away, and he would just come and watch my mom at night and freak us out by knocking on the door. This happened when I was 10. My mother left me in one of those arcade shops in a mall while she went shopping for groceries. When I first got there, I started playing the games I usually would go for. After a while, I decided that I wanted to play Dance Dance Revolution 
and I approached one of the employees and asked for help. He was a tall, dark man, with curly black hair and a beard, and he seemed to be in his late thirties, which made him look a lot older than the two other employees working at the shop. Of course, since I was just a child, I didn't care about such details. He acted very friendly and was helpful at first. He obliged and taught me, and watched me closely as I danced through the game. I didn't mind at first, because I thought he was trying to make sure I could manage the game by myself before tending to another customer. However, several songs later, he was still standing beside the game screen, watching me. I don't know exactly how to describe his stares, but they made me feel unpleasant and uncomfortable. It got so bad that I could no longer concentrate on the game and eventually stopped playing. Just remembering the way he was looking at me still sends shivers down my spine. I decided to try and play some other games, but he followed me to every single one. I was hoping that he would get fed up and leave me alone, but he never left. What makes this even creepier is that his facial expression went from being the kind employee to slowly turning into something more serious and dangerous. Then the realization hit me. Taking a closer look, this man was not an employee. He was wearing something that resembled the uniform, but not exactly. I was a very shy kid, and despite there being so many other children with their parents and other employees at the shop, I couldn't muster the courage to ask anyone for help. Since I was alone, they probably all thought that he was my guardian. I tried my best to ignore his presence, and just continued playing different games, hoping my tokens wouldn't run out and my mother would be by to pick me up soon. Finally, I decided not to wait for my mother, and just go to the grocery store myself to find her. The arcade was located on the second floor, and the grocery store was on ground level. I was about to go down the stairs. That's when I noticed that this man was still following me all the way outside the shop. He caught up to me fast, and to my surprise, he whispered something in my ear. I couldn't hear him well because of the noises from the arcade. Noticing my confused expression, the man smiled as he slowly placed his hand on my shoulder and repeated himself, What's your name? Fortunately, at that moment, my mother came to pick me up. I looked back at the man, and all of a sudden, his expression changed back to the kind person who helped me out earlier. Still scared, I watched him as he played the nice guy to my mom, who didn't suspect a single thing. I didn't tell my mom this man was stalking me either. I just really wanted to leave. When we were walking back to the car, I looked behind me one last time. I really wish I hadn't. The man was still staring at me. He slowly waved at me and winked, before silently mouthing the words, I'll see you. That was the scariest moment of my childhood. This happened years ago, when I was about eight and my older brother was ten. My dad was stationed in Japan, and this took place about three years in, so we were very familiar with the area. So that no one thinks badly of my mother, who is amazing, crime and harm to children in particular was punished with incredible severity, so it was normally very safe to be out by ourselves. We decided to walk the five blocks off base to our favorite arcade, which was about 20 floors up. We had to go out the base gate, across the tracks, and make one left turn to get to the building. It's really a straight shot from the entry gate. As we passed one of the first shops, I noticed an Arab man an all-white traditional dress, standing in the alleyway. This man stood out, not only because of the way he was dressed, but also because he was not a local. Me and my brother saw him, but didn't think much of it, until he steps out behind us after about a half a block. We both take note, but we keep walking. 
it begins to gradually start gaining on us, enough so that we both look at each other again, and we can see that we are equally uncomfortable. My mother has had her own past traumas, and was always very open with us about the dangers that children faced, and I immediately got the sense that something was not right about this guy. So seeing the look on my face, my older brother leans in and says, Let's see if he's following us. We then picked up our pace, make a right turn, and then two left turns. Bringing us back to our original route, if he had been going his own way, he would have never done this. But sure enough, he followed the whole way. As soon as we made it back to the original street, my brother shouted at me to follow him, and we took off. The guy shouted as soon as we took off, and the two times I glanced back, he was chasing us at top speed. We had done some triathlons with my dad, so we were in good condition to run. In the next five blocks, we ducked through street shops and took alleyways trying to lose him. We ended up going to the building and taking several escalators to the arcade. The man was following us the entire time. When we got there, my brother dragged me behind the biggest machine we could find, which was up against the wall. We soon saw him emerge from the escalator. He then realized he was on a floor packed with children. He briefly looked around in frustration, and then disappeared. This was a time before cell phones were commonplace, so we still had to get home. My brother hailed a cab out front and made sure there were tons of people around. When we got back to the gate, we had the guard call our parents so they could come pay for the cab and pick us up. Needless to say, we stayed on base for a good while after that. So last summer, I booked a glamping trip in the next county over. Yes, you heard me right. Glamping. It's a real thing. The website looked promising. It was a campsite of six large yurts outside of a small village. Occasionally, I had driven through that village before, as it's close to a historic castle that I like to visit. We pay the fee, and my husband and I with our two kids were soon on our way. It was one of the last weekends of the summer, and the weather was lovely. The campsite was on a small hill, and the couple who owned this land lived on top of the hill in their farmhouse. We were checking in on a Sunday for two nights. We passed other people who were checking out, and they looked happy and satisfied with their stay. After signing in, the owners of the campsite showed us to our yurt. We were then informed that we would be the only ones staying on site. We were happy about that to be honest. It meant we could make as much noise as we wanted, and we wouldn't disturb anyone. When she showed us around, she did say that the yurt door didn't lock. None of them did. Which is fine, because you don't really lock a tent, do you? The campsite was in its own secluded area, and the owner said it was safe for our kids to wander around, since a perimeter fence surrounded the entire property. The first night was fun, we had a barbecue, the kids played around, and we all went to sleep around 8. I found it hard to fall asleep, but I often do whenever I'm somewhere new. The cell phone service out this way was patchy at best, but I managed to get a signal, so I did some reading, before finally falling asleep. The next morning, my husband seemed out of sorts. I asked him if he was alright, and he said, Yeah. I'm fine. So I left it at that. We went out for the day. The weather was blazing hot. We soon got back and began washing up after dinner. The kids were playing around outside. When a shadow came over the whole place, I suddenly felt like I was being watched, and the temperature suddenly seemed to drop. Honestly, it felt like something bad was going to happen. I felt dread come over me. We had already paid to stay, but I pulled my husband to the side and said, Listen, I think we should go. 
I don't know why, but I just have this bad feeling. Normally, he would try to talk me out of something like this, but this time, he didn't. He started getting the kids together, and I packed up our stuff. We went up to the farmhouse, where the owners were playing outside with their dogs. We explained to them that we had to leave early because our youngest was feeling sick. They said they were sorry to hear that. And then just as I turned to leave, one of the owners asked if my husband had been outside the yurt last night, around 3 or 4 in the morning. I said no, he hadn't left my side all night. I would have woken if he had. He asked me if I was sure. By this point, my husband had joined me. We answered no, and then asked why. Well, the man said, the security lights came on and the dogs began barking. And when he looked outside, there was a man who was wandering around the property, who then turned around and walked back toward the campsite. They assumed it was just my husband. We both said it wasn't, and then said our goodbyes quickly. We tore out of that place as fast as we could, and then a quarter mile down the road, my husband turned to me and said, I didn't say anything to you this morning because I didn't want you to freak out. But I had to use the bathroom around 3.30 in the morning. But as I was about to get up, I heard footsteps on the decking outside. I just laid there as quiet as possible, hoping that you or the kids wouldn't wake up. There was some unknown person walking around the campsite at night and was right outside of our yurt. It still crawls under my skin every time I think about it. Every year, for the summer holidays, my family and I go to my grandparents' house in a region of France called Bretagne. They happen to live on a cliff right next to a beach, which is pretty neat. And for you to understand the situation, I'll do a quick description of the place. And more importantly, how to access the beach. When we get out of the house, we need to cross a small road to get to an entrance between bushes. It's a clear but narrow path that you have to take just to enjoy the view of the sea, or you can also use a staircase that is built into the rocks. Then you'll have to walk on some stones before finally arriving at the beach. The place itself is pretty big, but there's only a couple of ways to access it. Also, one major thing that I have to mention. I was 18 at the time. I am the eldest of three other siblings. So I was done building sandcastles at this point. I started to climb the cliffs for fun. It was more so semi-hiking through partially collapsed cliffs. This will be relevant later on. So last year, after having dinner, I headed out for a walk on the beach. No one seemed to want to come with me, so I went by myself. Not a big deal. I did this all the time. After going down the staircase, I walked for a short while and then sat down on a stone to smoke a joint and listen to some music. Not the smartest idea, but hey, I was a teenager in a small village that I went to every summer. As much as I love my family, it gets pretty boring out there from time to time. Anyway, I'm enjoying my time when I spot a man out of the corner of my eye. Not unusual, anyone can access this beach after all. But then, he starts heading in my direction. His head was shaved, and he had these square-shaped sunglasses on. I would guess he was around his mid-twenties to early thirties. He was pretty tan, and looked like he worked outside for a living. I hear over my music that he's trying to talk to me. So I remove my headphones, and he said something along the lines of, Hey, do I know you're from somewhere? You look familiar. Have we met before? I answered with a calm but firm, no. But he kept insisting that he had seen me at the beach earlier. Maybe he did, but plenty of people come to this beach, and I don't recall ever seeing him. The way I'm responding clearly implies that I'm not interested in having a conversation with him, but he sits on the stone next to me and keeps talking, mostly about himself. 
He said that he loved coming to this beach. The weather is nice. But it was around this time that things got... creepy. He said that it's rare to find... nice girls around here. And he's happy that I'm not... a bitch. He then asked what my name was, where I live, and of course, I didn't say anything. He started to lean closer to me, which made me very uneasy. He also had a huge grin on his face. That's when it hit me. Remember when I said that there were only a few entrances to this beach? This asshole was sitting right between me and the staircase that led out of there. I was cornered, and there was no one around. We were completely alone, and even though I'm quite athletic, this man was twice my size, and he clearly wanted to continue our discussion. I remained unresponsive, and he started to sound annoyed, clenching his fist, but still wearing that stupid grin on his face. He then asked me if I was really a good girl, and why wasn't I talking to him? I'm shitting myself at this point. I then looked to my left, and almost let out a sigh of relief. There was a small cliff right next to us. I could easily rush to the top of it in a matter of seconds, as I've had plenty of practice before. From there, I could run onto the narrow path and go home. So I stood to my feet and said, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Good evening. The man looked startled for a moment, then briefly looked behind him at the staircase, which confirmed my suspicions. He thought that he had blocked the only way of escaping, since the other stairs were too far away. To this day, it still frightens me that that was his first reaction. At this point, I was tired and terrified but I start to walk confidently to the cliff. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see that he's standing now, looking in my direction. As soon as I'm close enough, I literally start jumping from rock to rock as fast as I could, scratching myself in the process. When I arrived at the top, I look back down to see that he's staring at me, not smiling like before, but frowning and looking very pissed off, as if he was on the verge of committing a crime. I then sprinted to my grandparents' house, and explained everything to my mother. The next day, I reported the man to the police, giving the best description that I could. Since it was a very small village, they could identify him easily if he was a resident. But of course, nothing ever came of it. I know that this may seem a bit anticlimactic, but this guy was planning on something, and I'm glad that I didn't stick around to find out what it was. This took place around five years ago. I was 14 at the time, and living in the UK. My family decided to take a vacation to Antalya, Turkey. We stayed for a week in a very nice hotel. It was around the third day, when we decided to go explore the city with a touring group. We went to some great places, and the final stop was the local market, where you could buy various souvenirs or knockoff brands. My father and I were looking at some wallets, when I saw one that caught my attention. A store employee came over and gave me the sales pitch, explaining that it was real leather, etc. I started asking my father whether he would buy it for me or not, he said that we would come back after we had looked through some of the other stores, just to make sure that there were no others that I liked. When we left, I had to look around some of the other stores, sorting through various items, but I never changed my mind about the wallet. When we had about 15 minutes left of our time in the markets, we decided to head back over to the store that had the wallet that I wanted. I went back inside, and I noticed that the wallet was missing from the place it was earlier. Unbeknownst to me at the time, my father had gone outside to help my mother with something, who had been texting him. I asked the cashier if the wallet was still in stock. 
That's a very popular brand. I'm not sure if I have any left. But, let's have a look in the back. There was a small door by the side of the checkout desk, which he then opened. It appeared to be a small stock room, with various items I guess he was planning to sell. He told me to follow him inside, as that was where he kept the rest of the wallets. I had been told about stranger danger from a young age, especially when staying in a foreign country. However, against my better judgment, I decided to follow him inside. He opened the door to allow me inside first, stating that if he still had that particular wallet I wanted, it would be on the other side of the room. I walked in without a second thought, and as I did, he slammed and locked the door behind me. Plunging me into complete darkness. I came to the sudden realization about what had just happened and began banging on the door and shouting for him to let me out. He yelled back to keep quiet or he would do horrible things to me. I still remember what he told me to this day and it still haunts me whenever I think about it. I will not repeat what he said here as I don't think it's suitable for YouTube. I continued banging on the door and screaming for my father. The man angrily hit the other side and yelled again for me to keep it down. Just as I was beginning to lose all hope, I heard my dad shouting my name. I shouted back, and I guess he heard me because what ensued was a shouting match between my father and the cashier. I couldn't make out most of it, but he told me after the fact that he was threatening to beat the living shit out of him unless he unlocked the door and let me out. I was stuck in there, terrified and worried about what was going to happen. I then heard the door unlock and swing open. My dad stood there, looking furious and terrified simultaneously. I ran out into his arms. He picked me up, which was very rare for him to do, and we quickly left the market. To this day, I always wonder what would have happened if my dad had not heard my screams. This story happened around Christmas in 2019. I'm 24 years old, and I have a twin brother who I'll refer to as Frederick. We live on the outskirts of New York City. We were both 17 years old. Every year our family went on vacation to Atlanta, Georgia to visit other family members during winter break. Frederick and I never really enjoyed flying with our family at all. Traveling with them was always stressful. They would always overpack their bags, and at the airport they would always take their sweet time chit-chatting and drinking coffee before checking in. It was nerve-wracking for us. In 2019, my brother and I wanted to travel separately from our family. On December 22nd, our parents agreed to allow us to drive to Georgia and they would fly out two days later. So we hopped in our 2002 Nissan Pathfinder and headed out to Atlanta, Georgia. The first half of the road trip went well. I was driving while listening to music, but after a while, our SUV needed a refill, so I had no choice but to take a random exit and head for the closest gas station. The sun was beginning to set, and the only gas station around looked to be deserted until we looked through the window and saw a store clerk. Still, it wasn't a very welcoming atmosphere. This place looked sketchy, but we had no choice, and I filled up the SUV. Afterward, my brother and I went inside to grab some snacks. We soon got back into the SUV and drove off. When we got a bit further down the highway, I saw the flashing red and blue lights of a police cruiser behind us. I was confused. I wasn't speeding. My plates may have been out of state, but they weren't expired or anything. So I slowed down and pulled over. The police officer came straight to my window 
and instead of asking for my license and registration, he said, Guys, I'm going to need you both to exit the vehicle. Now. Why? What do we do? Get out of the vehicle now, or you will be arrested for refusing to cooperate with a police officer. We both immediately got out, and were ordered to walk towards the police car. All of a sudden, the officer drew his pistol, and violently opened the back door, and shouted, Get your hands up now! Our hearts dropped when we saw a disheveled-looking man emerging from the back seat of our SUV. The police officer placed him in handcuffs and found a knife in his possession. Frederick and I were absolutely terrified. It turns out that while we were in the store, this creep decided to climb into the back of our SUV. The officer saw what was happening from a distance and quickly sped up to catch us as we drove off. God only knows what would have happened if that police officer wasn't there when he was. From now on, we always remember to lock our car doors and always check the back seat.